Hi everyone, my name's Claire Jay and I'm from a Pets at Home group and we're here to deliver um, a session today on, on data. Um, just to give you a bit of background around Pets at Home group, you've probably seen our stores at many retail parks, but we're so much more. We are the UK's leading pet care business um, and we provide pet owners with everything they need to be able to look after their pet and that includes food, toys, bedding um, and dog grooming services, right the way through to our first opinion and veterinary care. And, and obviously what makes that all up are uh, loads of different career opportunities and options and career pathways. Um, and one of the sort of exciting ones we're gonna sort of hopefully bring to life for you today um, is around data and analytics. So I'm gonna leave you here today and, and pass over to Ellen, who's gonna introduce herself and other members of the team. And we hope you really enjoy the session today. Thanks. So hi everyone, thank you for hanging on while I got that sorted. Um, I'm Ellen and I'm a business insight analyst at Pets at Home and I've been with the business about 12 months. Um, so I just wanted to explain a little bit about what my job is and what it looks like day to day and then we'll talk you through the task that we have prepared for you after that. So a business insight analyst means that I take all of our data and help to answer questions for the business. Things like, did people panic buy dog food as well as toilet roll during the lockdown? Which Halloween costumes are the most popular? And how many customers have recently bought a new puppy or kitten? And I can also find out fun facts by grouping, summarizing and filtering our data. So I can find out things like the fact that we sold 364,000 tennis balls last year and 303.8 million goldfish and 82,000 tonnes of cat litter, which weighs the same as about 4,500 double-decker buses. And this matters because even though those statistics might seem a little bit obscure to you, it means that we can help to inform the business and make the best decisions for your pets and for the business. So if we see a particular Halloween costume wasn't that popular this year, maybe next year we decide to do something different. We can find out who's buying what and make sure that the stores never run out. And we look at trends from previous years as well. So things like last year, we know that dog advent calendars were so popular this year, we ordered thousands and thousands more and we've already sold out. So. My job is great because I get the best of both worlds. I get to do a challenging job that involves lots of numbers and I have to be quite methodical and work in a really logical way to make sure that I don't make any mistakes in the data. But I also get to be a bit of a detective and a storyteller. And that's what we'd like you to do today. I go looking for clues in the data and pull out interesting insights. And then I present my story back to the business to help them make those decisions. So we want you to become data detectives and start to look for clues in our data, but with our help, of course. So this is what we see every day. And I don't want you to be intimidated by this because we've got some really great tools to help us make sense of the, these lines and this quite frankly, not very interesting data that's on the screen. So data grows very quickly. We've got 5 million customers who use our Import, very important pets loyalty card when they shop with us. So that's 5 million rows in our spreadsheet straight away. Now imagine if they shopped with us once a year, but buy three things. So three things in a basket quickly becomes 15 million rows in our data set. But what if they buy three things each time they come to our shop and they come to us every month because they need dog food every month? that becomes 180 million rows of data without even trying. So like I said, don't be intimidated. 
There's plenty of tools out there that help you get to the bottom of things. And we're going to show you a few that we use all the time before we set you off looking for your clues. And you don't have to be a whiz at maths, multiplying or counting. You just have to know how to make the computer do the hard work for you. So we use a language called SQL to narrow down our data set to the things that we're interested in. So sometimes that's data between two specific dates, only selected data from certain stores, or only looking at products that have the word dog in the name. And we've done that bit for you today to give you a clean data set. But before we show you how to become a detective, I just want to hand you over to Katie to give you a little flavor from another data role that we have at Pets at Home. Hi, thanks, Alan. So I'm Katie. Um, I also joined the business this year and I work in the data visualization team. So what we do is quite similar to Ellen, but we want to give the business a summary, whether that's on a daily business or a weekly business, and make sure that everyone across the business is looking at the same numbers. So this is an example here um, with some made up numbers put on there. So this is for Click and Collect, a project that we launched recently. And this is visualized in a tool called Tableau, which is super, super interactive and we host it online. So this can be accessed on different devices. So if, for example, a store manager wants to go in and see how their store is doing, they could access this on a computer in the back office, or they could look on their phone or on an iPad. So what actually makes a good visualization? So what the aim of our team is, is to show data in a way that's really, really easy for the user to understand. So you can see here, this is the time that orders are placed. So along the top, we've got every hour, and down the side, we can see the different weekdays. The idea here is in the stores, when an order comes in, they want to prepare it as quickly as possible. So here, the darker the color is in the square, the more orders are placed at that time. So you can see on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, they have loads of orders coming in in the morning. So a store manager might decide that they don't want to send everybody off for those breaks at those times because they know it's going to be really busy. And what we can see in Tableau is if we were to hover over one of those squares, some extra information will appear and we can choose what this is. But here we're kind of given the exact numbers. So there's an average of 117 orders that are placed on a Tuesday at half past nine over the last week. So it's a really great tool and it's really key that we make sure that everybody has access to only the data that they should be seeing. So even though we host it online on a server, only Pets at Home colleagues can see this data and we can make sure that if you were a store, for example, in Crew, when you log on, you can only see the data for your store. So we make sure everything's really secure as well. I'm going to hand over to Alex now from our data engineering team. Thanks, Katie. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Alex. I'm a data engineer and I joined the team uh, a few months ago. Uh, so what is data engineering? Um, the role of a data engineer is to make sure that all of the data uh, that is being produced um, around the business uh, is collected in the right way. So, for example, if you shop at one of our stores, um, you might be uh, generating the data for pets at home, or if you go and visit a vet, you might be generating uh, some information within our vet system. The same is if you try and shop online or you use an app. So these are all uh, the same activity, but uh, for us is basically a new record that gets created in a different system. So it is really important for us to make sure that all of this information gets then um, brought in into the business and goes where it needs to go. So um, the two important things that we need to think about is how do we connect to these systems? So what's the best way of connecting? And for example, if you think about what you do uh, with your devices in your day to day life, if you were to want to watch something uh, on Netflix, for example, you might have to decide whether to watch it on your phone or whether to watch it on a TV. So that is pretty much what we need to decide. So what is the best way of connecting to all of their data sources? And then how often is all of this data produced? How much of it uh, is being produced? So as Alan said, um, 
every interaction that our customers have can scale up very, very fast. And we need to make sure that Ellen and Katie and their teams are getting uh, the data they need when they need it and that they can make sure that it is all correct. So um, that is it from me. I'll pass it back to Ellen to talk about your task. Thank you. If you just give me two seconds to get the task up, we'll start to talk you through that. Okay, so the task we've prepared for you today is to give you a little bit of a flavor of that data insights role that I was talking about. Um, and we've prepared a little challenge for you at the end as well. And there is a prize involved, so pin your ears back. Um, I'm gonna start by explaining the data and then run through a quick example with you, just so that you get a feel for what we do and how we do it and some of the the more ad hoc tools that we use. So it's not always necessary to produce a dashboard out of every piece of analysis that we create. Sometimes we just want a few numbers to put into a slide to feed back to someone quickly. And I'm gonna show you how we do that as well. So if we start by talking about our data tables, I think it's really important that we mention that this data on its own doesn't tell you everything that you need to know. So this is our customer IDs. So we've got a list of customer names and then they're each assigned a unique ID. So no two customers will have the same ID in this table. And it's this ID that links things across the data sets. So if we go and have a look at the next data table along the bottom and customer addresses, we can see that there are no names in here, but we know that this unique ID will link back to a customer's name. The same goes for their pets. There's an owner ID that we know links back and each individual pet also has a unique ID because they're a unique pet. And then we've got a list of their pet types and a list of their names. And then we've got some shopping data and this is just a, a simplified view of what I showed you on the tab that I said can be quite intimidating, but I think once once it's been explained, it, it's fairly easy to interpret. So each customer has their transactions attributed to them. And then each customer will have a unique basket number. And within each basket, there's a unique number of items. So we can see here that customer 20 has got in their first basket, two items, cat food and dog food. They've bought three of each the prices of each item, and so the total, because the total of that is three cat foods times two pounds is six pounds in total. But this doesn't tell us anything just by looking at it. What we need to do is create some insight out of this to really start to tell a story. So we're going to run through the example with you and explain a few of the functions as well. So. The first thing that I think it's important to do is understand which pets belong to which owners. And we can do that with a really simple thing called a VLOOKUP. So in this cell, I've created a VLOOKUP here. And you're able to say, look up the owner ID from your customer IDs table and tell me which name matches customer ID 30. And then we're going to fill the rest of the table in by dragging it down so that we can see who belongs to who really quickly and easily without having to jump between this one and say, OK, Carl's number three and then go into here and find number three. It's done really simply in here for us by just linking the customer ID and the pet ID. So we want you to find some things out. So we're going to show you how to create some charts and some tables to get to those answers. So firstly, um, we're going to make an example chart of pet types. So I've set all these up for you for when you download this. So you should just be able to double click inside this where it says no data and it'll bring up a chart editor for you. 
We're going to stick with a column chart because they're a really good way to just eyeball your data and have a quick look over them and see if anything unusual stands out. But there's a couple of things to be sure of. So for this one, we're going to show a count of pet types and see if anything jumps out at us. So we need to be looking at the pet data and you set the data range using this button here. And then we need some axis. So as I said, we're gonna make one of pet types. So we select pet type to go across the bottom and it generates a chart for us that counts how many times each pet type appears in this pet data. So everything looks okay but there's one pet type along the bottom that is standing out to me as a little bit unusual and something that you wouldn't necessarily expect people to have in their, in their homes. So I can see here that there are nine reindeer in this data set. So I think it's worthwhile finding out a little bit more about these reindeers. So to find out a little bit more, we can start to use our filters. And if we go back into our pets data and choose our filter, we can search for reindeer and we can see if we can find out the owner ID. So we can see that all of these reindeers are owned by the same person. And we could do that even quicker by just going on who belongs to who. And because we've set that up, we now know that all of these reindeers belong to Nicholas Claus. And as you can see, the owner ID is the same and each pet ID is different. And that's how we know that they're all the same owner. So we're getting an idea of who this could be. It's important before you move on to clear your filters on each data set before you move on between questions. Otherwise you might end up only looking at selections of data and that might not give you the truest answer. So we're just gonna clear that and make sure we reselect them all. And then we're gonna go and have a look at the customer addresses to see if we can find out anything more about Nicholas Claus. I think we've got a good idea of who it is, but it's always sensible to check. So we know that his customer ID is number seven and now we've got his postcode. So. If we were to Google this postcode, I say if we were to Google this postcode, one second. <laughs> Well, anyway, I can't find the tab to do it. But if we were to Google that postcode, it would tell us that Nicholas Claus lives at number one reindeer land. So I think it's fairly safe to say that we know who this is now. We know that this is Santa Claus and that he's got nine reindeers and that he's been shopping with us over the last few months. And I think he's probably starting to get ready for Christmas. So I think you'll all manage that really easily. But I think there's, um, we've added a final element into our quiz that is hopefully gonna stretch you a little bit. Because, and I think that because I still get these kind of things wrong a lot. So pivot tables are quite tricky and they can go wrong without really trying. And it's best just to take it slow and think about what you actually want to show in the data and build it up bit by bit until you find what you're looking for. So let's see if we can find out what Father Christmas has been buying for his reindeers for pets at home. So I've set this pivot table up here with the customer IDs as one row each. And in the editor, I've selected my data to look at the shopping tab so that we can have a look at this and summarize it using the functions in the pivot table. So pivot tables take our data and apply summaries, sums, counts, and sometimes multiplications to give us clear and easy to read information that we can narrow down until we find exactly what we're looking for. So 
we know three things about Santa Claus already. We know that he's customer ID number seven. We know he's got nine reindeers and we know that he lives at, in reindeer land. So let's try and set up a pivot table to have a look at his shopping baskets. So we need the customer IDs in rows so that we can find him. And then we're going to add, a, add some rows for item descriptions so that we can see what he's been buying. And we're also going to add price so that we can see how much he's been spending. Now this is looking a bit full, so we don't necessarily need all of these. And we can turn off the show totals. In values, we want to add a quantity and total because at the moment we don't know how much each of these items cost. So if we add a quantity, we can see that customer number two has bought two cat beds. And so that we don't have to do that total ourselves, we can also add a totals column that will tell us 15 pounds, two cat beds is 30 pounds in total. And then by leaving this one on, we can see that customer two has spent 90 pounds. But we're not interested in all of the customers. So to filter, we can filter on customer ID and we know who Father Christmas is. So we're going to clear everybody and just select Father Christmas. So here's what he's bought. He's bought 27 lots of carrot flavor treats. I presume that's because he's got nine reindeers. So they're getting three treats each at a price of two pounds with a total of 54 pounds. And there's some other items in there as well, but one of them doesn't look quite right to me. So we know that Father Christmas has got nine reindeers, but he's buying a cat bed. And I don't know about you, but I don't think any of his reindeers are gonna be small enough to fit in a cat bed. So we need to go and see if there's something else more interesting in the data that we can dig into. So let's work backwards and try and figure it out. We know about Santa Claus, everything in here apart from his address. So let's go and filter on his address and see if it tells us anything interesting. So we know that it is MA. Ah, so now we can see that there's also another customer with that same postcode. So it might be that somebody else is living with Father Christmas. Let's see if we can find out who they are and what pet they own. So if we use our table where we've joined everything together, we can apply the same filter. So if we just quickly knit back to here, we're now looking for customer number 51. So let's go and see what's happening. Customer number 51. And we can see that by filtering on this data, customer 51 does have a cat called Snowdrop and the owner is Mary Claus. So I think it's safe to assume from our data that we've got in this pivot table that this isn't a mistake this is something we should be expecting. And he's probably buying Mrs. Claus a new cat bed for her cat. So in order to answer your questions, we're going to share the quiz with you and share a copy of this task so that you can download your own copy and work on it in your own time. Um, and I suppose that's everything, but if there have been any questions in the chat while we've been talking, I'm sure the three of us are more than happy to to go through those now. Um, yeah, but I suppose all that's left to say is, is good luck with, with the task. Thank you so much. Um, that was really, really interesting. And I suppose anyone that's watching, um, if you've got pets, I'm sure you've heard of pets at home or whether you've shopped there, understanding everything that goes on behind the scenes just for you to get a click and collect order or just so they know how to kind of promote the right products to you is, um, is, is really interesting. And you made it look really, really simple as well. So um, 
So yeah, as Alan said, we can um, answer any questions now. We've got a little bit of time. So if anyone does have any questions, whether it's about data, about pets at home, um, about what dogs they have that they're taking to the office, um, or about the um, quiz them itself, then obviously please just put them in the chat box on the stage tab now and we can get those answered. Um, we will obviously send everything round. Um, we'll send everything to your tutor and that'll get sent out to you that has um, the quiz on it and the files and you can have a go at that way. We'll also share this video as well so you'll be able to watch Alan take you through the process. So any questions? I think everyone's been very quiet today. I think everyone's ready for the Christmas holidays. Aren't we all? <laughs> No, it doesn't seem like we're getting any questions. I think the prize is an Amazon voucher if anybody's wondering what the prize is. <laughs> Amazing. So what is it? What will you be looking for from, from everyone? Okay, so we've set up a bit of a treasure hunt to go digging around in our data and, and see if they can find the answers to some questions. Um, it's set up as a Google a Google form. So you'll just be able to type your answers in and submit it. And we're looking for a complete set of, of correct answers. Amazing. So there, that's something fun. At least it's kind of pet related and Christmas related. So, it is. <laughs> so yeah, that's perfect. So thank you. Um, if we've not got any questions, oh, then um, I, oh, here we have. Oh, has COVID made data analysis more important? Yeah, it definitely has. And we've done a lot of work around how the lockdown has affected our the way we operate. Um, I think Katie might be able to tell you a little bit about why Click and Collect is so important and um, how that's been impacted by COVID. Yeah, so this Click and Collect project that we've released um, really recently um, so normally when we have an order that comes through and it's the click and collect, that will be kind of fulfilled by our distribution centers, so where all the products are and they'll get sent to the store for the customer to then come and collect them. Um, what we've actually done really recently is we've made it so if a customer orders products and all of those products are in order, or sorry, in stock at that store, the store can kind of fulfill that order. So. The idea there is that we're having less customers going in and they're you know browsing on shelves and then they might be going you know a bit close to each other in the store everything is already packaged and ready for them and as soon as that order is ready to go which is normally within a couple of hours so it's really really quick um the customer will receive an email and they can go and just show the code that they've got and then they can collect the order um and then it, it's a lot quicker for them so that's in terms of kind of the orders um, another thing that we had to look at related to COVID was actually absences within the store. So each store needed to be able to see if they had, you know, half of their colleagues that were shielding or were on furloughed or were absent for a COVID related reason. They needed a way that they could see that really quickly. So that was another report that we put together. Um, stores could go in, area managers could go in, and we could also see that from our support office and um, kind of, you know, if if there was an area where there were loads of absences due to COVID. And we could also compare that with the government's data. So the government had a data set which showed kind of the rates of cases around the country. So we could compare that and we could look, you know, if it looked like there was a really high rate of infection in Birmingham, we need to make sure that our health and safety colleagues can get into those stores quickly, make sure we've got enough equipment for, you know, face masks, sanitizer, all that kind of stuff. So. I guess it's kind of two sides that we've looked at COVID, um, but Click and Collect is a huge one, which is uh, the project's going really, really well so far. To um, think a little bit as well about Click and Collect, it is the customer facing element, but it's also our behind the scenes warehouse element. By introducing this Click and Collect and being able to package those orders up in store, we've been able to reduce the pressure on our warehouse as well. So all the web orders would typically go through our warehouse and they've been super, super busy at capacity for weeks on end. And by taking some of the pressure off them and, and moving it into store, we've helped them out as well. Yeah, that's really interesting. And um, so much goes on behind the scenes, isn't there, that we that we, we just don't realise. Um, there's just, we've had another question here. Is this area, so working in data, 
do you need to have a strong mathematical basis? Um, no, I don't think so. And this is this, this was sort of the whole reason I was interested in doing something like this is because I'm not mathematical. I haven't done any formal maths qualifications since my GCSEs. Um, I've got a geography background. Um, I think it's more about, I mean, the good thing for me is that I've got a, an interest in people and why they do what they do, but I don't have an interest in maths. <laughs> um, I've got an interest in making the computer do the maths for me. Um, and that's what these tools are all about. It's making it really accessible and taking away that fear of, of having to be good at numbers. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point because yeah, things like this, when you talk about data, we've talked about it earlier that there's a there's a myth around what coding is and the type of person that's going to become a coder. Um, and I think, yeah, the same with with data that you, you don't have to be kind of super hot on maths and things like that. There's the platforms that are out there, the things that are built. Um, yeah, like you're saying, you're looking at the at what a person does and why they do it. Um, to inform other things. So I think that's a really, in, really interesting point. Is there anything, any other questions before we move on? Um, yeah, do, does your company offer degree apprenticeships? I'm not aware. I don't know if the other two know any, any more than I do. Claire would certainly know. Yeah. We can find out um, and we can, we can definitely feed that back. Um, I think what you'll find in a lot of businesses that there's a lot of different um, opportunities available from like grad schemes through apprenticeships and apprenticeships go from kind of your level three, level four up to a degree apprenticeships, but they may offer degree apprenticeships in a particular area, but not in others. So I think there's, a, there's so many different things that are going on depending on the route that you want to go in for, but we can definitely find that out and we will, um, I'll pick up with Claire and we can feed that back to you um, um, so you know what the opportunities are. We are currently looking into apprenticeships uh, and um, we're probably going to be offering them site from next year. And data analytics is actually one of the uh, areas um, we'll be, be looking at apprenticeships, so I believe that uh, the social media channels will, will be shared afterwards. Are going to have all the information after uh, mm -hmm. when that starts. Yeah, and I think that's that's a really good point. Is you know follow the social media channels because they will they'll they'll talk about all the products and they'll share all the photos that you want to see, but there will be a lot of really interesting information that comes out um, about kind of working in this area as well um There's before we finish of, sorry it's just that uh also we have pictures of cats on our social media <laughs> so, I mean. come for the cats and then you find out about your apprentices um before we leave them because this, we haven't got any other questions that i don't think at the moment um might just be really interesting just to kind of talk about each of your backgrounds and how you got into working with data because obviously ellen you you started us off saying that you're not into maths. Kind of, what was your route into getting into this um, job? Um, well, is it useful if I stop sharing my screen and then you can, yeah, see who you're talking to? There we go. Um, so I come from a geography background. I thought I wanted to be a transport planner, um, and then I went back to university and did a master's and a PhD in geographic data science. Um, but I've always been interested in people and, and why they move where they do and how they interact with the, the city they live in and, and things like that. So I'm, I'm not a mathematical person. I like people and storytelling and, and picking out those interesting insights. Um, but just because I've gone and done quite a lot of further education, it doesn't mean that that's a necessary thing to do to get into a job like this. Mm -hmm. What about you, Katie? What was your route? So mine was math. Um, so you don't have to have math. Um, I, I think the whole thing around math and data analytics is kind of that it's the way of thinking. I think normally if you're interested in math, you tend to be quite a logical thinker. And I think it's more that aspect. So I think that's kind of where that correlation comes from. Um, so I, I only went to uni once um, and I did math there. I actually did a year out in finance um and I was awful at it so, so bad it was yeah it was really bad um so I kind of looked at what else I could do 
and I guess similar to Ellen, I was interested in that storytelling and kind of how do you take, you know, obviously we look at a screen and we see rows and rows of Excel. Um, and I think it's a, a similar view about math that it, it scares a lot of people and puts people off and they think, I don't want to be just looking at rows and rows of data. So how do we actually, you know, kind of transform that for the business? So I did a graduate program um, in analytics and that's where I learned how to code. So I didn't learn any of that at uni. Um, a lot of it was people in the team. There's a lot of online training. Um, and it, I think it's relatively, it's quite straightforward to pick it up. That's not to say I don't have days where I'm thinking what's going on. This is completely wrong. It won't run. It's not working. Um, but yeah, I ended it up in it kind of by accident. And then I've, I've stuck with it for a few years now. And it's, I've now gone into like the reporting side. So it's more, how do we write code that's really efficient, that's going to update every day and it's not going to cause a load of pressure on the server, it's not going to go wrong somewhere. Um, yeah, so a little bit more mathematical, but again, a, a little bit by accident. Yeah, I like what you said about you kind of learn everything sort of going into that scheme and on the job. And I think that's one of the things that no matter what your route is, a lot of what you do, you do learn in the job now, don't you? Because and things are changing so quickly. Um, yeah. And then Alex, what was your route in? Yeah, so I uh, studied physics at uni and I was absolutely pants at it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but we had some uh, coding and that was really interesting and really fun. So I started uh, an apprentice, well, sorry, an internship uh, for a data consultancy company uh, without knowing anything about SQL, uh, like SQL and anything about um anything <laughs> and i as katie was saying i learned on the job um a lot of um what it means to work with data platforms and things like that and to be honest uh, i haven't used a lot of maths but i have uh, uh used a lot of problem solving and building things so for data engineering as long as you're interested in like how things fit together you would probably be all right Perfect. Well, thank you very much. Um, so Katie, Ellen and Alex, thank you for your time this afternoon and putting together that amazing spreadsheet about Santa and his reindeer. It's really <laughs> enjoyable. Um, so a huge thank you to you guys for giving your time. Um, so if I'm watching, obviously, we will send around the details. So we'll send around a video of the session today so you can watch Ellen kind of talk you through um, the, the the platform and how to find that and we'll send you the quiz and what the prize is and how to enter that as well so hopefully you can get involved and someone will win that that prize so we're going to have a short break now um and we'll be back um at 10 past two so when we come back at 10 past two we're not going to be on the stage we're going to be back in the sessions area and that's where we're going to meet the role model so you'll get the chance to ask questions to people that are working in all different parts of the industry um so again Go and have a quick break, um, get yourself a drink, get yourself snacks, do what you need to do, and then we'll be back in the sessions area at 10 past two. So thank you, everyone. Thank you.